let's say you have some NLP solution for several languages. Maybe you have a named entity recognition solution or um, sentiment analysis solution. And now you would like to support more languages, but you don't have any training data available. And uh, some of you might know, or many of you probably know, that it's really expensive to acquire and it takes time to get raw data, uh, training data, sorry. But what you do have is raw data. So this talk is going to be about how can you expand your solution to new languages using transfer learning. And I'm going to explain it to you on an example of CV parsing task that we are trying to solve at Text Kernel. So, uh, as uh, Lena already told, I'm an intern at Text Kernel, and at Text Kernel we match people and jobs. And CV parsing is the core of our solution. So, we solve CV parsing in three stages. First, we do section segmentation. So, during section segmentation, we extract sections. So, we extract, uh, for example, personal section, experience section, education section, and then other sections as well. Then follows item segmentation. So, during item segmentation, within each section, we extract items. So, for example, from experience section, you can extract first, exp uh, first experience and second experience. And then, during the last stage, phrase extraction, we extract phrases. So, for example, from experience section, you can extract phrases like job title, organization, location. Or from education section, you can extract degree or university. And this talk is going to be about phrase extraction, and in particular, I'm going to talk about phrase extraction from experience section, and I'm going to show it to you on the example of German and English languages. So, CV parsing task can be formulated as a sequen sequence labeling task, and you can think about it uh, as of something similar to named entity recognition. And uh, to solve this task, we use BioLSTM plus CRF architecture. If you want to read more about the architecture, I would highly recommend you to read the paper by Huang et al. Or you can also have a look at our talk at PyData in London 2018. But um, this is how it works in a nutshell. So you have words, and then you get embeddings from those words, and th then you pass it to the BioLSTM layers, and on the top you have CRF layer, and then in the end you extract the entities. So you have location, name, phone, and others. So, um, let me tell you how it all started. It, in text kernel, we now support 20 languages, and new languages are coming, and we want to support more languages, but uh, we don't have label data for those languages, and it takes time to get it. So, what we want to have instead is we want to have a multilingual model that will allow us to parse several languages at the same time, and uh, we hope that this will uh, help us to implement new models for new languages as fast as possible and also improve performance on low resource languages using transfer learning and cross-lingual embeddings. So what are cross-lingual embeddings? Cross-lingual embeddings are word representations that capture two main things. So first, we want semantically similar words in the same language to be nearby. So you can see Hochschule and Universität in German. We want this to be close by. And then we also want translational equivalents in different languages to be close by. For example, we want programmer in German and programmer in English to be mapped close to each other. So. Um, there are several ways how you can get cross-lingual embeddings. The first one is you can just download uh, cross-lingual embeddings. And I can uh, highly recommend you to have a look at this Muse GitHub rep repository. This is a Facebook project. And they have 30 languages there, and they map it all in the shared space. And actually, if you use this, you already get quite good results. But uh, the problem with using pre-trained embeddings is that normally they are trained on some generic data, so they either use news articles or they use Wikipedia articles. So they're quite generic and they might not work for your domain specifically. Also, um, they might not have the languages that you want to implement in your product specifically. So if you want to do transfer knowledge from Russian to Slovene, for example, you might not find it um, in the Muse. So what you can do instead, you can use the open source alignment code. And uh, what you would do then, you would first trade monolingual embedding separately for all the languages you want, and you will use your domain data to do that. And then you will use the alignment code to map it all in the same space. And um, there are different solutions available online that you can just uh, check out. 
The first one is the bilingual solution. Uh, this is the project called VecMap, and they map two languages into a shared space. And then there are also multilingual solutions like multilingual fast text, U, uh, U, UMWE or CCA, and they map multiple languages to the same language or to the shared space. And uh, at text kernel, we are now for our research use PRCCR solution. And I'm going to explain you in a second why we find this one good. So CCA is a canonical correlation analysis, and uh, this is how it works. So you first train monolingual embeddings for one language. So you train German monolingual embeddings, then English monolingual embeddings, and then you construct bilingual dictionaries. So you have a word, uh, the, the pairs of English to German. And then from those bilingual dictionaries, you learn transformation matrices in such a way that words in this bilingual dictionary are maximally correlated. And then you map the original German and English space to the shared space using those transformation matrices. And then what happens next is that right now this uh, omega, omega star and sigma star are in a shared space. And what you can actually do is that you can map the transformed German embeddings back to the English space using the inverse of transformation matrix of English. And what it actually allows us to do is that right now we can map German to English, but then we can train it again for some other language and then map this language to English, and then all the languages will be mapped to English, so we can support mul multiple languages at the same time then. So um, I told you what cross-lingual embeddings are. Now I'm going to show you a more visual example how we train them. So this is the bilingual dictionary, and you have letter and manager, and engineer and engineer, and then you learn the transformation metrics from these pairs, and then you have entwickler in German. This is a new word that was not in the bilingual dictionary, and you map it back to the English space using the transformation matrices that you learned, and you hope that it's going to land somewhere close to the de developer in English. There are several ways how you can use cross-lingual embeddings in your project. So first setup is the zero-shot parsing setup. This is when you do not have any German data available. So this is when you only have English data. And what you do is you first train English monolingual model the way you would normally do. So you have English trained data, you use English embeddings, and then you train English monolingual model. And then during the testing time, you use projected German embeddings to parse German CVs. Another case is joint training. So this is when you have some German data available, and what you do then is you first combine English trained data with German trained data, then you use English embeddings and project the German embeddings to train the cross-lingual model, and then during testing time you do the same. You use projected German embeddings to parse German CVs. Okay. So now I told you some theory behind it, and uh, right now I want to share with you some experiments that we've done, because we wanted to check whether transfer learning works for us. So this is our experimental setup. We wanted to parse German CVs, and we wanted to extract job title and organization name from experience section. And embeddings we trained on our domain data. We used word to vec and we used CCA to map them into the same space, which was, in our case, English. And we wanted to answer two questions. So first, whether transfer learning worked for us. And then we were also wondering whether bilingual dictionary influences the performance. So you remember that I showed you this uh, bilingual dictionary from which you learn the transformation matrices. And actually, if you tweak it a bit, you will see now that it actually influences what you get in the end. So um, we had several experimental setups. So we had zero shot. We used in this experiment 3,700 English CVs. And then we had joint training setup. This is when we combined uh, English and German data. And you can see that we incremented German data because we were actually also interested in how adding more German data influences the cross-lingual gain, the transfer gain that you get. So first question was, does transfer learning work for us? 
And uh, at the picture, you can see the gray bar plots. They represent the German baselines. So those were trained only on German data. So you see uh, first 200 German CVs, then 500 German CVs, and then all the German CVs we used in this experiment. And as expected, the more German data you have, the better performance you get. Then the blue bar plots, they represent the cross-lingual uh, setup. So first you see the zero-shot parsing case. Uh, and you actually see that we get 75% F1 score in the zero-shot case. This is when we didn't use any German data. This is when we trained English monolingual model, and then we used cross-lingual embeddings in the test time. And this is actually not that bad if you think about it. And then we were uh, combining English data with German data, and you see that when we add 200 German CVs, the gain is 4% from the cross-lingual gain, from the cross-lingual embeddings. And then you add 500 German CVs, and then you get a little bit less. So basically what we can see from this picture is that the more data we have in the low resource language, the smaller becomes our cross-lingual gain. Okay, so the second question was, um, how does the bilingual dictionary influence the downstream task performance? So first, uh, how can we actually construct bilingual dictionary? How can we get it? Um, well, you can use ready bilingual dictionaries. You can check out the Internet Dictionary Project. But this one, it was created by volunteers. And actually, it was not created for training cross-lingual embeddings. This was created just to make dictionaries available for the Internet community. So maybe you might not want to use it unless if you have uh, your language pair in the Muse. Uh, Facebook project again. So Muse, they have uh, 110 bilingual dictionaries there for different language pairs. And these dictionaries, they were created specifically for developing and evaluating cross-lingual embeddings. So they are already a bit of, they have a bit of a better quality. But uh, same as with pre-trained embeddings, the thing with bilingual, the radio bilingual dictionary are, is that uh, they are trained using Wikipedia or news articles, so they're again quite generic, and they might not be the best um, anchor words for training the matrices for your domain. So what you can do instead, you can construct your own dictionary using your domain data. So what you need to do, you first need to choose English words, in our case, English words. And uh, you need to consider several things. So first, filtering. For example, you might not want to include stop words in your bilingual dictionary. Then frequency. So you might want to take top frequent words or less frequent words. And then size. So do you want to take 100, 1,000, 5,000 words? And then you can translate your selected English words to German using Google Translate API or Yandex Translate API or any Translate API that you like. Um, and this, we conducted several experiments to see which factors influence uh, the downstream task performance. So here we checked how the source of data of your bilingual dictionary influenced the performance. And we compared Internet Dictionary Project with Muse vocabulary with, and uh, our CV vocabulary. And what you can see here, so on the left side, you see the joint training case. So this is when we used all English data and then 200 German CVs. On the right side, you see the zero-shot parsing case. This is when we only used English CVs to train our model. And then during testing time, we used cross-lingual embeddings. And you see that in both cases, CV vocabulary gave better results, but in joint training, much less so than in zero-shot parsing. And by this, I mean that actually the difference between different vocabularies in the joint training doesn't matter that much. But in the zero-shot parsing case, you see that uh, the difference between EDP vocabulary and then Muse vocabulary is around 10%, and then around 3% between Muse vocabulary and then C vocabulary. So in the next experiment, we were wondering how frequency influences the downstream task performance. So we took either top 5,000 frequent words, or we took from 5% to 10% most frequent words. So those were less frequent words. 
And the reason behind it was that actually some researchers, they, sh they showed that cross-lingual embeddings, they don't perform that well on less frequent words. So they thought that, uh, well, if maybe if we add less frequent words into our bilingual dictionary and we learn transformation matrices from less frequent words, the results would be better but they actually were not. So top frequent words, they gave us better results. Again, both in joint training setup and zero shot parsing setup. And again, in zero shot parsing setup, the difference was much bigger. And the last experiment I'm going to talk about is uh, about size of bilingual dictionary. So we experimented with 1,000, 5,000, and 10,000 words in the bilingual dictionary. And we saw that 5,000 and 10,000, they, first of all, they gave almost the same result both in joint training and zero short parsing. So maybe you don't even need 10,000. Maybe it's enough to have just 5,000 words. Uh, and then we also saw that it gives better results than 1,000. Um, and again, in zero short parsing, the difference between 1,000 and 5 and 10,000 is bigger than in joint training. So, our experiments with bilingual dictionary showed us that for constructing dictionary we need to use domain words, frequent words of size 5,000 and 10,000. And we also saw that the less training data you have available, the more attention you need to pay to the bilingual dictionary. Okay, so now I showed you how we trained uh, our cross-lingual model and then how we set up our bilingual dictionary. And I would like to share with you some examples of the shared space uh, that was uh, trained using this bilingual dictionary setup that I just described. So 5,000 top frequent words and domain uh, vocabulary. So these are examples of words that were included in our bilingual dictionary. So English administrator, it was in the bilingual dictionary. And here you can see top closest words for this English administrator in our cross-lingual space. And you can see that among the German neighbors, you see admin and administrator and system administrator and IT administrator. So those are all good neighbors for English administrator. So we are pretty happy with this. Then for English programmer, which was also in the bilingual dictionary, you see German neighbors such as developer, programmer, software engineer, etc. So we see that our cross-lingual space captured the semantic between English programmer and uh, German programmer. These are examples of words outside of the bilingual dictionary. So team letter, it was not in the bilingual dictionary. So we didn't learn the transformation matrix using it. But still, the neighbors are pretty good. So you can see that the English neighbors of German team letter, which is translated as team leader, are supervisor, facilitator, leader, motivator, manager. So those are all um, job titles. And this is actually what matters for our CV parsing task. We actually don't really care if those are exact uh, translations of Team Lighter. We just, uh, we just want it to be job titles because we only extract job titles and we do not do any distinction between what kind of job uh, it is. So another example is Copenhagen in German. So it was not in the bilingual dictionary again. And you can see that the English neighbors of Copenhagen are Israel, Netherlands and USSR. And you might think like, well, maybe those are not the best neighbors, but again, they are all locations. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what matters for our CV parsing task. Um, so I think that uh, everyone, when do does this kind of evaluation of cross-lingual embedding, should keep in mind what kind of task you are trying to solve. So maybe for your task, this might not be the best uh, cross-lingual representation. But for us, this is really good enough. Um, we wanted to evaluate our cross-lingual space intrinsically and for that we created the held out set on which we wanted to test our words later on. And personally, which is personal in German, appeared to be there. And we noticed a weird thing. Actually, personally, he was not parsed really well. It was parsed as name and it is not a name. And the reason for that is that personally, angabe, which means personal um, information, Probably, uh, it's <laughs> uh, it, it it occurs oftentimes with names, and that's why the neighbors of uh, Personlihe, the English neighbors of Personlihe, they are all English names, and that is why it was oftentimes mislabeled as name, which um, 
yeah, which is not good for us. We don't want personally here to be a name because it's not a name. So what we did, we added personally here another header words from the CV vocab to our uh, bilingual dictionary and we made sure that they are all there. And uh, we retrained our cross-lingual embeddings and then we actually got better uh, cross-lingual space. So you still can see some English neighbors over there, but now you can also see uh, words like personal or curriculum or Europe as curriculum, which are better, better neighbors for personally here. And actually using this cross-lingual space, we now parse personally here correctly, meaning that we don't label it as a name. So I told you now about all those experiments with English and German language, and you might be wondering whether it also worked for other languages. Well, it does. Well, it did. Uh, so we also did experiments with Dutch and English. And here you can see a very similar picture as with uh, English and German. So on zero-shot parsing, we get 79%, um, which is pretty good. We didn't see any Dutch data. We only trained uh, English monolingual model and used Dutch English cross-lingual embeddings and we got those results. And then you also see the similar picture that as you add more Dutch data, the gain from cross-lingual embeddings becomes smaller. We also did some experiments with Slavic languages. So we mapped Czech to Russian and then Polish to Russian. And here on zero-shot case, we got 84% for Czech and 81% for Polish, which is I think that's amazing. I mean, we didn't see any Polish or Czech data. We just uh, trained the model on Russian data and we already get, get um, 84%. So um, what did we learn from all our experiments? First, uh, transfer learning works for our task. We got pretty good results on zero shot. And we also noticed that cross-lingual gain reduces uh, that as we add more data from the target language. And we also showed that the quality of bilingual dictionary affects the end task performance. So the less training data you have, so in the zero shot case, the more attention you need to pay to the bilingual dictionary. And um, we suggest to use five top frequent words in your domain vocabulary if you want to get better results. Thank you for your attention. That was it. Thank you.